Why? Because of the cultural differences, cultural misunderstandings, things got lost in the translation. And a lot of the new Muslims did not find the support which they needed. So we, alhamdulillah, developed this structure what we call as a revert support program, which we are running in Scotland and in Birmingham Central Mosque as well, with the cooperation of the Birmingham Central Mosque at the moment, where anybody who takes shahada, we take them in, we befriend them. We provide a sister with a sister, friend and a brother with a brother friend, who guides them, doesn't prescribe to them, just guides them to their journey in Islam. Just to help and support and they're there for them to answer questions and to help with a lot of social issues which come with it. Because a huge part of it is, see when a, when a brother or a sister takes shahada, their social setup is gone. They can no longer go to the club or the pub, or the, which, which is for us, it is like, oh, club and pub. But for them, that's the life. That's the life they know. That's socialization. They see us as sociopaths because we don't go to the clubs and pubs. Because for them, that's the only place to socialize. So when a person takes shahada, where do you want him to go or her to go? The family disowns them. They can't go back home. Sometimes they're kicked out of their own home as well. They come to the masjid. Masjid... Unfortunately, a lot of the time they don't have the language skills or other skills and they certainly don't have anything to offer them. Where do they we have, They took them in and we know all that isar and sacrifice, people giving up their wives, people are giving up their houses for them. Where is that today? These new Muslims, these reverts are muhajireen. They have done hijrah from kufr to Islam. They need ansar. And whether we like it or not, we have to be the Ansar for them. We have to be the brothers and sisters for them. So this is why we are going from mosque to mosque, masajid to masajid, group to group, and literally begging them, please, brothers, come out of this thinking pattern. This is a massive responsibility, and Allah will ask us about this responsibility. We have to take it on. Whoever you are, whatever your school of thought is, Bismillah, you keep your school of thought, but help out with this help out with the new Muslims and fulfill the fundamental responsibility. So in Scotland, we have a group and in, in Birmingham, we have a these are two established groups now, alhamdulillah. We give out free Qurans, free Dawa literature, and the Dawa literature is looked from the perspective of non-Muslims. The group that the, the people who actually look at our literature are new Muslims and non -Muslims. look it from the eyes of reads it. Yeah? So what Dawa literature you provide, what questions they ask, they are totally different than questions we ask or we as born Muslims ask. So you have to look at things differently if you want to help them. So Alhamdulillah, with, that, with a brief introduction, we have some literature at the back. Please take it with yourself at the end of it. Dawa, I'll try to cover. We usually have regular Dawa trainings and it takes about at least four long sessions to cover all aspects of it. So today, I will only touch upon three areas. One, what exactly is da'wah? What are we calling people towards from the perspective of the Qur'an? Number two, what is the method which the Qur'an has prescribed? And number three, how do we actually do this from the sunnah of Prophet ﷺ? And the, part, the third part is, how did Prophet ﷺ meet people for the first time? What does the Sunnah and the Seerah tell us about when he met people for the first time? Not later on, first time, and we'll try to learn. Them. Because that's the Dawa is meeting the person for the first time. So let's start by looking at um, the first part. So the first thing I want to do from the bottom of my heart is to congratulate you. Because there are roughly about, give or take, two million Muslims in this country, in UK. And if Allah has given few people throughout the country, alhamdulillah, there are people throughout the country doing this job. Different groups, different organizations, alhamdulillah, there's always some people who are trying to call people towards Allah. It's a real blessing from Allah. And make no mistake, it's not just us, Allah has given us that tawfiq. So he definitely saw something in our hearts that he gave us this tawfiq to come and to actually be here and inshallah do, do dawah as well. So the first question is now, before we contemplate, okay, I want to do da'wah, alhamdulillah, I want to do this, I'm passionate about it, understand it. What, what is da'wah? What exactly is da'wah? Da'wah, you know, the, 
the current terminology we can use, although we should never um, use or substitute the Islamic words or the Quranic words, because they contain much more comprehensiveness. But the, the translation we could say is an outreach. You, you reach out. You reach out to people and you call the very word dawa means to invite somebody, to call out to somebody. You know, when, when you're calling, this, this calling out is with, with compassion. See, when you, when you try to help somebody and say, come on here, don't go there, come here. This is the right way, that kind of invitation, that kind of da'wah. Um, so this was the duty of the last and the best of messengers, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam, and all the prophets before him. It's, it's to be a da'i, to call towards the path of Allah. And they used to attach themselves to society, to people. And we'll learn that from the Qur'an, how, how the prophets all call towards Allah and they all attach themselves to the society, to the, to the issues of the people. So for us to be given this opportunity, believe me, there can't be a better honor and dignity than this, that Allah gives us the tawfiq to follow in the footsteps of these great men. Nobody has walked this planet better than the messengers of Allah. So if we are... Even the thought of it, if I am so lucky to just walk on those, tiptoe on those steps, subhanAllah. That's an amazing opportunity, really. So what is the call about? This is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Rum, verse 30, Allah mentions this. فَأَقِمْ وَجْحَكَ لِلدِّينِ حَنِيفًا فِطْرَةَ اللَّهِ الَّتِي فَطَرَ النَّاسَ عَلَيْهِ So stand up, you know, set your faces upright to the true faith on the fitrah on which Allah has created. So the deen that Allah has given us, for which we are calling, is human fitrah, human nature, on which Allah has created fatara nasa alayha. La tabdila li khalqillah and Allah's takhliq does not change. Meaning regardless of which era, which time period of human history you are living, Fitra doesn't change, takhliq doesn't change, your DNA does not change, that is still there. You'll have same emotions, you'll have same thoughts, you'll have same understandings, and you'll have same temptations for your nafs. So Allah says, you stand up and you follow that fitra which Allah has created you upon. And ذَلِكَ دِينُ الْقَيِّمُ This is the established deen. This is the deen that you follow your fitrah on which Allah has created you. However, majority of the population unfortunately do not understand this. That the fitra, the nature, is what actually guides you to Allah automatically. And what Allah has given us as deen is purely, fits purely on what our nature desires or deserves. So to discover our true self, and follow the natural path and to attain moral uprightness after we have gained physical uprightness. You see this faqim wajhaka, stand up, be upright, show uprightness. This is human fitra. I'll, I'll show you how. This is how human fitra works physically. Baby born from one month to the 12, 12 month. When a baby is born at one month, he's just lying on the back, isn't it? Yeah? Food. Clothing, eating, drinking, washing, cleaning, everything done by parents or whoever is taking care of. What else do you need? <laughs> what else do you need? Every care, you have no care, nothing at all. But the baby does not want that. The fitra does not want that. Does the baby have a teacher? To teach the baby to crawl? To ask the baby to lift your head up? At two months the baby tries to, to lift the head up. Then, seven months it tries to get up. And by ten months it's trying to hold on to something to stand up. And by twelve months, most of the time, give and take. It wants to be upright. فَأَكِمْ wajhaka, Make your face upright. This uprightness is fitra, it's nature. No baby is not going to get up if it's a normal baby. They want to have that uprightness. So physical uprightness, we have no choice. We automatically do that, even when we don't have proper understanding, we do that. After that, the moral uprightness is what the deen gives us, inshallah. 
So da'i for what? What is it that we have to call people towards? So what is the da'wah? So before a person does da'wah or invites somebody, what is the invitation for? If you go to the da'wah stalls, which we have up and down the country, alhamdulillah, the person will start talking to you. So why, why, why do you keep your woman behind the bars? Why are you so terrible to your woman? Why, why is she so oppressed? That's your, that's your question. That's the question. So if you entangle yourself into that question, then you give a half an hour lecture of Islam gave these rights, Islam doesn't do this, Quran doesn't say this, Sunnah doesn't say. Then you'll say, okay, why do you kill everybody then? Why are you all terrorists? And then you've got another half an hour, killing one person is equal to killing whole humanity. Half an hour another, then say, yeah, but, but why, why is it that you have to wear this jubba? Why this, why, why, why parda? Why, why this? It will never end. It will never end. Why? Because two difficulties there. One, this person has already bombarded, he's already made up a mind about this is wrong and I now need to find a fault. And if he, if he doesn't agree with my one fault, I will give him another fault. So when you do the awa, first and foremost thing that we need to understand is we do not want the person to take us to his world. We want to bring him to our world, right? Because regardless of how satisfying your answers are, that person is not going to be satisfied. So what you do is you change the discourse completely. When the person asks you those questions, say, brother, do you want to know about Islam? Yes, I do. Most of the time. Nine out of the ten people will say, yes, come on, then let's have a chat. Let's leave your question for a minute. I'll come to your question, but let's have a chat and talk about what is Islam. What is a message of Islam? And then you give him these three fundamental teachings which Quran teaches us, which is Tawheed, Risala, and Akhirah. These are the fundamental teachings of Islam. For any open, open any page of the Quran, you will either find one, two, or all three of them being discussed on that single page of the Quran. And what is that? So we say that there is same God. Allah is not some Arab God which we have invented. He's the same God. Same creator, Elohim as mentioned in the Bible. And any name you want to call him as the Quran says, Abidullah, Abidur Rahman, whether you call him Rahman, you call him Allah, it doesn't matter. As long as you understand the qualities of Allah, as long as you do not associate partners with Allah, you do not misunderstand the concept of the Khalik, the Fatir. Yeah? So once you have cleared that there's oneness of creator, you cannot have more than one God. And there's a topic on that, which we will cover inshallah, hopefully when we do another session with yourself, how to do that. But what today we're learning what is the methodology? How do we break that cycle of somebody wanting to take us to their world? Second is Risala. Allah chooses only one method to communicate with people, his message, that is through the prophets. That is through Wahi, that is through the angels. And that is how Allah has mentioned previous books and the final book of Allah. That's how it was conveyed, that's how he, con that's how he communicates with us. He reveals his message to us. And third is Akhirah. So we've got oneness of creator, we've got oneness of message, all the messengers brought the same message. And third is oneness of the purpose of life. That this life that we have been given is there as a test to select among us those people who are deserving of Jannah. That's the only part. And that can only be done on how we live this life and how we will be judged on the Day of Judgment, each one of us, everybody individually. And this, these, Tawheed, Risala and Akhirah, this is what we approach people with. This is how, this is what we call people towards. That this is oneness of God, oneness of the message and oneness of the purpose of life. And this was the message which was given by all the prophets. There's absolutely no difference in that. This message the prophets gave to us. And Quran gives us this indication. That Muhammad was ordered by Allah. You follow the millet of Ibrahim. You follow, follow him. Because he was Hanifa, he was pure, clear, following this one path. And Wamakana min al Mushrikeen, and he was never associating partners with Allah. And also, um, in Surah 42 Shura, Shara'a lakum min al-Dinima wasabihi nuhan wal-lazi yawhayna ilayka 
وَمَا وَسَّيْنَا بِهِ إِبْرَاهِيمَ وَمُوسَى وَإِسَى that we have given you the same sharia, same deen which we had given to Musa alayhi salam, Isa alayhi salam, Nuh alayhi salam, Ibrahim alayhi salam that you do not divide yourself, do not divide your deen into groups and sects and do not be mushrikeen Allahu yajtaba ilayhi man yashaw wa yahdi ilayhi man yunib and Allah is the one who chooses from people whom he, who, whom he you know, wants to. So this deen which Allah has we talked about the deen because that's what we are sharing. When we talk to people, when we invite them to Islam, we have to widen their concept. And the Quran has given us that understanding. Do you ask any other deen, meaning way of life? When? So the deen of Allah is already being followed in letter and spirit, in everything that you see around you. So first was human nature, we looked at the beginning. Human nature doesn't let us lie down, it has to give us moral uprightness, after physical uprightness. Second is that anything and everything around us is followed by, is, 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 there, there is a system and a structure which is followed in letter and spirit and Allah says that is the deen. They have submitted to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They are following the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in letter and spirit. So that's your deen. Inna deena in the Allah al-Islam. And then the deen or the way of path of Allah in the sight of Allah is only Islam. And the people who were, because the second question is, okay, if only one deen was given by Allah, why is there so much of division then? Why do we have Jews, we got Christians, we got Muslims, and we got the division upon division upon division among all these groups? Allah gives the answer. And we might not like the answer ourselves in, in the day and age we are living. And Allah says, Those people we gave the kitab, the book, they only dif- they divide it, they only cause the ikhtilaf because it wasn't because they didn't have the knowledge. Oh, they had knowledge, they had full knowledge. But what, what led to that? Mutual jealousies. Mutual, I am better than you. My view is better than your view. Yeah? And it's happening in Muslims as well, sadly. So Allah has warned us against it. Do not do that. Do not do that. Why do you want to do that? Allah has sent you the book. Allah has sent you the kitab. Allah has sent you to follow one, one, one thing only. And Allah is going to take them to account if you start dividing Allah's deen. So this was the first part of what we have to give them. Tawheed, Risala and Akhirah. And we call them the same natural way of life. Natural, that nature. In nature there are signs that Allah's deen is being followed. Allah's commands and structure is being followed. Second is, how did the prophets attach themselves? How do we attach ourselves? Do we just sit in the masjid then? Or do we actually go out and attach ourselves? So we talk about Moses, Musa alayhi salatu wasalam. Uh, in, in Surah 7, where Allah says that Moses said to Pharaoh, apart from, apart from giving Tawheed, Risala and Akhirah, Dawah, he said to them, I am a messenger from Lord of the worlds. I am truthfully bound to say nothing about God except the truth. And I have come to you with a proof from your Lord. So send with me the children of Israel. Because he had enslaved them. So the freedom of the children of Israel was part of what he had to do. He attached himself to the society, to the community by looking at the oppression, oppression of those people. And Musa salam said, this is my duty as a messenger as well, to free them from you. You need to free them. You need to take them away from this oppression. Isa salam, Jesus peace be upon him. What did he see? Again, Surah um, Ali Imran, Allah says this in the verse 50. And I have come confirming which was before me of the Torah and make lawful to you part of what was forbidden to you. He was specially sent to make, a, you know, and why? And I have come to you with proof from your Lord and will take them through. So what, was, what had happened? The, the Jewish rabbis, the scholars of their deen, what they had done, they had made hundreds of things unlawful and haram. On every Saturday, even self-defense or calling for help for, for a doctor or something to save a patient's life. Even for a serious condition, no, 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 there was a laugh among them. Should we call or should we let him die? He will die as a martyr if you if if don't call that. And you know, this, this kind of extremism had come into their society, into their thinking pattern. 
So one day, this is again mentioned in the Bible that Isa alayhi salatu was on his way to the, to the synagogue or the temple. And although it was a Sabbath day, it was a Saturday, he reached out his hand to pick up two pieces of fruit to feed a hungry child. This was considered to be a violation of Sabbath. And all the Jewish rabbis, look at him. He calls himself to be the messenger of God. And he's breaking Torah. He's breaking the law of God by giving this food to this, to this child. And he made a fire for the old woman to keep themselves warm from the freezing air. And that was also considered as another violation by these people. He went to the temple and looked around. There were 20,000 Jewish priests registered there who earned their living from the temple. They were dependent on the temple. They were earning their wealth from the temple. And what, what, what did they do? Isa alayhi salam observed that the visitors were fewer than the priests. There were more priests and less visitors. Yet the temple was full of sheep and doves, which were sold to the people to be offered as, as sacrifices. What did they do? They had these sheep and doves in the temple, and they used to ask people to buy these sheep, to buy these doves, and then... So might just have to slightly go on this side because of the thing. So they, what, what the system they had created was that within the temple, they had sheep and doves, which people used to bring and as offerings for the sake of Allah. So what they would do, they would keep them there. And then they would ask the people to buy them again. And then they give them back as a, as a gift to the temple or the, or the synagogue. So they had an amazing business over there. And they were dependent on them. Every step in the temple cost the visitor money. Every step they would take, they'll have to do this. And they worshipped nothing but money. That's what they worshipped, unfortunately. A anytime they entered that temple, they were asked to sacrifice this, give money for this, give money for that. And that was all they were interested in. There were two groups in the, in the temple. The Pharisees and the Sadducees, which are the ruling class, if you like, acted as if it was a marketplace. And these two groups always disagreed on everything. And, and, and forgive me for saying this, this brings to light our current masajid, where we have a masjid committee on one side, and then we have some other people on the other side, and never agreeing, always disagreeing. There's always something happening, unfortunately. We need to think about it. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in one of the hadith warned us that you will follow, you will follow in the footsteps of the Jews. If they went into a, a rabbit hole, you will go into that rabbit hole. If they went into a lizard hole, you will go into that lizard hole. We are, we are falling in letter and spirit, sadly. So Isa alayhi salam was sent as a mercy, as a messiah to people to take all these burdens away and to make their life easy. To bring them back to Allah's deen, which is yes sir, which is easy, which is, does not have usr, which does not have hardship. So the, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in the Quran that they, the Jews and the Christians, took their rabbis and their monks to be their lords beside God by obeying them in things which they made lawful or unlawful according to their own desires without the evidence from the book of Allah. So Adi bin Hatim, and this is, he was a famous Christian as we know, he came to Prophet Sallallahu to understand Islam and he asked him several questions and one of the questions he asked was about this verse of the Quran. He said that we never worshipped our rabbis or our uh, you know, priests. We never worshipped them. But the Quran says that we worshipped them. So Prophet Sallallahu told him, is it not a fact that you accepted as unlawful what they declared as unlawful and lawful what they declared as lawful? And Iddi bin Hatim said, yes, that, that's right. He said, what else is Allah? What do you understand about Allah? Allah means the one authority, the only one authority, which has to make something halal and haram. That's only Allah's right. And you gave that right to your priests. And at the head to say yes, he said yes. Unfortunately, that is the case. We did do that. We did let them do this. So let's call about Shoaib alayhi salam. So we looked at Musa. Moses alayhi salam gave freedom, fought against oppression. He really had to fight. Then we looked at Jesus alayhi salam. He had to fight his own people. You know, he was Rasulullah alayhi Israel. He had to fight them to change this, 
this you know, nuisance which they had created in the name of Deen and he was given, as Allah says, to take their burdens off, to lessen the burdens from the people. Prophet Shaib he, call, he calls people to keep business corruption free because they were corrupting in business, they were really corrupt tradesmen and he attached himself to associate with the situations of the people and they also used to sit on the paths of people and they used to threaten them, hinder them and even loot people. He said, don't do this. Why are you making things so difficult? So he, that's example of Shoaib um, now our beloved Prophet So what was the first act in Mecca which was made haram? That was killing of a girl child. Two things in that society were one, the, the, the women, girl child especially, and the second, the slaves. And both the things Prophet when the Quran said, Bi ayi zambin qutilat, when on the day of judgment this girl child is asked, For what crime were you buried on that day? It was powerful. It's so powerful. Even today when you read it, it's subhanAllah. So Allah, that was the first thing. He gave society. You see, prophets and da'is, they are givers. They're not takers. Society has to see a da'i as somebody who has something to give to the society. If you've got nothing to give, society is not going to take it. This is a reality of life. If you've got nothing to give, so you, can, you can go on what you want to do with nothing to give, nothing to offer me. And prophets, if you look at all just these examples that I gave, they had something to offer to the society other than the tawheed, risala, and the akhirah which is the fundamental, but that doesn't change. All these people, Shoaib salam, he gave Tawheed Risala and He didn't give up Tawheed Risala and Akhira. That was fundamental job of his. But in addition to that, what is the society needing? What is the issue? What are the problems? No, I, I speak so many times with the brothers. I tell them that, you know, if people had to go back in time, about 50 years, when the Muslims arrived in 50, 60, more than 60 years now, when Muslims arrived in this country, the thing that they should have done is to open halal bars and they laugh at me. So what? Open halal bar? I said yes. Because this society had bar or a club or a pub as the only gathering place. It's not possible to do it now because now it's, it would have a totally different connotation. But at that time, it would have, people would have looked at that as yes, this is how I did. So see how Prophet ﷺ did in Medina, what did he do? They used to invite everybody. So the first dawah he did was invitation. When people had had all the food, then he said, Allah has sent me with this. Second time they had nadir, people who used to call up and warn them about an impending attack. He did that in, the, in, in that Faran, in the valley of Faran. So you have to use techniques which are relevant to people. So again, this ayah of Surah 213 verse of Surah Baqarah, Allah has given a nutshell why there are so divisions? Because when you do dawa, this is a fundamental question which will be asked again and again in so many different ways, and we have to answer that question. When Allah says, "Kana nasu ummatan wahida," whole mankind was one after Adam was there, before Noah was sent. Then what happened? فَبَعَثَ اللَّهُ النَّبِيِّينَ مُبَشِّرِينَ وَمُنْزِرِينَ Then they deviated, and Allah had to send nabiin. He had to send prophets. They were mubashirin and munzirin. They used to give them glad tidings that if you do good, Allah will reward you. And if you do wrong, unfortunately, we are warning you. وَأَنزَلَ مَعْهُمُ الْكِتَابَ بِالْحَقِّ Then Allah sent the kitab with them, with a purpose. لِيَحْكُمَ بَيْنَ النَّاسِ فِي مَخْتَلُفُ فِي So that they would be able to judge based on those books, based on the book of Allah, if they had any اختلاف, if they had any disagreements. Yeah? وَمَخْتَلَفُ فِيهِ إِلَّا الَّذِينَ أُوتُوا مِنْ بَادِهِمَا جَاءَتْهُمُ الْبَيِّنَاتِ بَغِيًا بَيْنُهُمْ Again that same thing which we learned earlier on. That the only reason people divided and they continue to divide is just out of mutual jealousy. Not because Allah has not guided us. Not because Allah hasn't given us answers to those ikhtalafs. فَهَذَ اللَّهُ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا لِمَخْتَلَفُ فِي مِنَ الْحَقِّ بِإِذْنِهِ So Allah has guided now this book, this Qur'an, again, وَاللَّهُ يَهْدِي مَنْ يَشَاءُ إِلَىٰ سِرَاتٍ مُسْتَقِيمٍ And Allah is the one who decides according to his hikmah, according to the qualities he knows that the person deserves to be guided, he guides them based on that. So every human knows, I'll, I'll, I'll inshallah finish this before we have a bit of a break and then we'll continue on the second session. See, every human being knows this. We talked about fitra earlier on. 
every human being knows what is right and wrong. We can understand without even the need of Allah sending us a book. Every human being knows it. And the ability to distinguish between good and evil and to appreciate good and evil is innate. It's inbuilt in our. The Quran has actually talked about it when it says, Inna hadaynahu sabil. I have already guided him naturally. He's already guided towards the right path. He knows. And that's what the nafsul lavama comes in. You know, when we do something wrong, there's an inner voice that tells us, I shouldn't have done that. Even if we make so many excuses, but that inner voice tells us, I shouldn't have done that. That's what nafsul lavama is all about. وَحَدَيْنَهُ najdain, And we have shown him both paths. Natural. This is natural you know, um, paths that Allah has shown us. And all human beings have the same nature. Muslims and non-Muslims. All human. human. Human nature is the same. That's what we talked about fitra in the beginning. And you know, we know how when from the history, a common history of humans, Adam's sons, you know, Habil and Kabil, um, Abel and Cain, when he killed him, what did he do? He didn't want to leave him there because his fitra, he, his guilt came up. He said, no, I can't do this. He wanted to hide him. He wanted to bury him. And he did that out of fitra, out of nature. That's Allah you know, explaining to us how nature works about good and evil. It, it, even if you do wrong, it still tells you, I shouldn't have done that. And you want to try to make up for it. What is, you know, from a psychological perspective, we call it cognitive dissonance. When somebody has done something wrong, they try to cuddle and kiss somebody and say, well, I'll give you something more today. Why? Because he knows he's done something wrong and he wants to make up for that. And that's, that's human fitra, human nature. So this is an inner voice. There you go, nafs al بَلِ الْإِنسَانُ عَلَى نَفْسِهِ بَسِيرًا وَلَوْ أَلْقَ مَعَازِرًا In fact, Allah says, in fact, man himself is a witness <coughs> upon his true self. Regardless of how many excuses he may put up. It doesn't matter. <coughs> this fact is mentioned in the hadith of Prophet ﷺ, which is reported by Imam Muslim. That virtue is professing high morals. And sin is what pricks your heart. In your heart, it, pricks, it tells you, no, I, shouldn't have, I shouldn't have done that. And you would not like others to come to know about it. And this is the area of Dawa, which we have to, when we're speaking, remember the first talk is, what is it that we're speaking to people? This is what we need to speak to people about. You know, we don't have to answer all their questions. As I said, they will try to divert you question upon question upon question. We go back, take them here, and ask them about your fitra. What do you think? How do you feel when something wrong happens? What do you feel and why do you feel that? And because majority of the population that we live in now are either of the atheistic or agnostic background rather than the Christian background, they, will t they can't run away from it. Despite that, despite having no religious background, despite having almost a hatred for religion, they can't run away from the fitra. And Quran wants us to say to people, this is your fitra. You return back to that fitra. That is the dawah, that's the understanding. Whether they accept it or not, that's a different story. But despite all this similarity, what, does, what leads to differences then? Why do people have difference of, of opinion? That this, this is because we all think differently. We, Allah has given us this power of intellect and also the power to choose and refuse. We choose and refuse. We, we may accept something. One thing may be acceptable to me, but the very same thing that the person will say, well, I, I, I don't think that's, that's right. Because how we are born, where we are born, where we live, what ideas have been going in our mind, we come with a lot of baggage. And all of that baggage that we carry with us is like a prism. We see everything through that prism. And that prism causes all these differences. The same color would be red for me, the same color would be green for for somebody else. As long as it's, but the right and wrong is not changed. This, this is, regardless of what prism we have, the right and wrong, everybody will say, no, that, that is right and this is wrong. So let's remind again of that verse 213 where Allah has mentioned that the differences were caused because of mutual jealousies and mutual differences, not because Allah hadn't given us. So Jazakallah khairan, we'll break over here for a cup of tea and coffee for people. Um, because I have, I've gone way over 20 minutes which is the usual focus time.